Arkadaşlar kısa bir duyuru yapacağım. Ee, tabii katıldığından da belli olduğu için. Çok e, kıymetli bir konuğumuz var. E, sanırım hocamızı ağırlamak için hala hazır değiliz. E, salon yeterli gelmedi. E, birkaç ufak duyuru yapacağım. E, kayıt aldığımız için lütfen hani bir saat sonra e, yoklama almaya çalışacağız. E, çıkışta yoklama almaya çalışacağız. E, şu kapıları değil de kayıta müdahale de olmasın diye yukarıdan alacağız. Seminer bitişinde yine e, kapıları kullanabilirsiniz. E, taktığım için e, çok değerli hocamız Melih Hanım'a davet ediyorum. Dear distinguished professors and beloved students, uh, today TED University is having the pleasure and honor of welcoming an invaluable academician, engineer, writer, and social scientist, Professor Dr. Said Tanbir Vasti. Dr. Vasti is an emeritus professor in the civil engineering department at Middle East Technical University, and today he will give a speech on language, literature, and life. Before leaving the floor to Dr. Vasti, I would like to introduce him briefly. Said Tanbir Vasti was born on June 4, 1941 in Lahore, Pakistan, into a family of scholars and academicians. He received his high school education in Karachi and was awarded a scholarship to study civil engineering at Middle East Technical University in 1957. He graduated with honors in 1961 and was selected to continue his graduate studies at the University of Cambridge, UK, on a scholarship funded by the Central Treaty Organization. After completing his PhD in January 1965, Dr. Rusty returned to teach in the Structural Mechanics Division at Middle East Technical University, where he worked for 45 years. In 1966, he married Yıldız Güvenç, a young colleague teaching soil mechanics in the same department. On leave, Dr. Vasti worked as an assistant research engineer in the structural engineering and structural mechanics division of the civil engineering department at the University of California, Berkeley, between August 1969 and July 1981. At the beginning of 1970s, he taught courses on structural mechanics at Osman Gazi University, formerly known as Eskişehir State Academy of Engineering. He also served as a professor in the civil engineering department at the University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore, between August 1976 and August 1978. Subsequently, he took up an assignment as a research engineer in the structural engineering and structural mechanics division of the Civil Engineering Department, University of California, Berkeley, between December 1978 and September 1980. After being retired in 2006, he has worked as a visiting scholar at Robert Morris University in Pittsburgh during 2009 and 10. Said Tanvir Vasti is the author, co-author, and editor of numerous technical publications in English and Turkish. His technical interests comprise, but are not limited to, limit analysis, plates and shells, finite elements, box girded bridges, earthquake engineering, engineering education, housing problems and transfer of technology. His non-technical publications include translations from several languages as well as over a dozen journal papers on various social historical subjects dealing with the Ottoman Empire and South Asia. As an example to his famous translations, the poem written for the victory of Çanakkale War by Necmettin Halil Onan can be given. Dur yolcu, bilmeden gelip bastığın bu toprak bir devrin battığı yerdir. Eğil de kulak ver, bu sessiz yığın bir vatan kalbinin attığı yerdir. And his translation is, Stop Wayfarer, unbeknownst to you this ground, you come and tread on is where an epoch lies. Bend down and lend your ear for this silent month is the place where the heart of a nation sighs. He published a book titled An Introduction to Late Ottoman Poetry in 2012. Besides, he is the author of Social Science Citation Index 26 articles published in Middle Eastern Studies Journal. He can speak seven languages. Urdu, Turkish, English, Arabic, Persian, Ottoman Turkish, and German. 
Dr. Vasti has delivered lectures on various subjects in Turkey, Pakistan, Cyprus, Jordan, Czech Republic, the United Kingdom, and the USA. He has awards from several organizations and institutions, such as Central Treat Organization and Metu Parlar Foundation. Now I want to leave the floor to Dr. Vasti to hear his inspiring talk. text in front of me and you also have the text in front of you. I shall not stick to the text religiously but I shall substantially say what is written here. Well, I must express my thanks and gratitude to the invitation that I received from Dean Gune Özcebe, an old friend of mine, when he asked me to deliver a seminar with the title language, literature, and life at TED University. I have presented similar seminars, at least similar in general appearance, but not similar in contents, elsewhere at Middle East Technical University. So this is a seminar that contains a certain amount of certainly much new information. Language, literature, and life are three phenomena which are intimately related and they cannot be separated in the existence of all human beings. Language, literature, and life also influence and determine each other. Now, as I expect that most of you have a Turkish background, I have purposely chosen some examples from Turkish history and literature as well. Well, you notice that the words language, literature, and life all start with the letter L. This gives a repetition of sound to which the ear gets accustomed. This is called alliteration and is frequently found in poetry of all countries, but also in English poetry. Sometimes it is overused, in which case it becomes humorous, facetious, not serious. There is a poem written over 200 years ago by Alaric Watts, which begins, An Austrian army awfully arrayed, boldly by battery besieged Belgrade. Well, this is overdoing the alliterative part. But in the work of a true poet, alliteration is like music. Now note the couplet in Fuzuli's famous poem called the Sukasidesi. Note the melodious repetition of the S sound. Dest bu si arzusu ile ger ölürsem dostlar Huze eylen toprağın sunun anınla yaresu. Now if you turn this couplet into English, it says, O oh friends, before I can kiss that lovely hand, if from here I should depart, in a jug made from the clay of my body, serve water to my sweetheart. Now this alliteration is called a figure of speech. <clears throat> there are many such figures of speech. The metaphor, the hyperbole, the oxymoron, the epigram. They lend color and texture and wit to what has been said. We should not discuss these. But the reason why we touch upon them is that they indicate that good writing is not just an accidental expression of thought. Literature should appeal to the mind, but good literature must appeal to the heart. Everybody, some of you, the younger people do not, but the older people know this song.
for many things, but not for this song. He asked for this song. And the music for this song was composed by the famous Haji Arif Bey. He supplied the music. But what is less known is that the words of this song were by no less than Nam Kemal, the poet of revolution. So you see, he supplied the words. In his short life of 48 years, he accomplished a lot. And the story behind this is given by the son. The son of Nam Kemal writes in his autobiography. And his son, Ali Ekrem Bulayr, he says, It was at the command of the Sultan Abdul Hamid, who was stricken with grief over the death of a young princess, Behije Sultan, that my father wrote these verses, which were set to music. Now, this is a rather sad story. And it, is, it happened almost 150 years ago. But you can see how the streams of life, literature, and language come together over a table of music, actually. So see, these phenomena interact with each other all the time. Now I turned this into English and I said, my broken heart can find no cure. I know this pain I must endure. Though all doctors may try to heal, this wound I shall forever feel. The arrow of your looks hurts still. Your eyes are ready for the kill. Fail to convince my love, I will. This wound I shall forever feel. Now, every known language has a literature. But we must separate literature from journalism or from technical jargon. Common conversation is often ungrammatical. And many people, young people especially perhaps, employ slang expressions. But by literature, when we say literature, we mean what the French call belle lettre, or beautiful writing. Everybody appreciates from within that literature must comprise creative writing of recognized artistic value. 
Now, in the 18th century, Voltaire defined literature, he said. Une connaissance des ouvrages de goût, une teinture d'histoire, de poésie, d'éloquence, de critique, which may be rendered as a knowledge of the works of taste with a mixture of history, poetry, of eloquence, and criticism. Now, this is a very comprehensive definition of literature, and it is impossible to improve on this. In 1947, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a text called Qu'est-ce que la littérature? What is literature? Now, being an existentialist philosopher, he said the answer is different depending on whether it is the reader or the writer who is asking the question. The writer writes for an audience of people, not just for the approval of the audience, but more likely to change the opinion of a majority. Now, all literature is aesthetic experience. It delights, but it also instructs. Now, Basil Willey, who was professor of English literature at Cambridge University, and I knew him in my younger days, he says that literature has this advantage over other studies that its subject matter happens to be life, not some subspect section or specialized department of life, but the whole of life. Life as lived and reported upon by the most sensitive, intelligent, imaginative, and articulate people. Now, the rapid development of materialistic sciences and technology in the last century, has resulted in producing a partial devaluation of literature and humanistic studies. Furthermore, there is also some difference in emphasis between what might be called the Western and the Eastern approaches to life and literature. The joy of literature in the East is usually collective and public. In the West, it is individual and private. The emphasis in European culture is mainly on beauty and freedom of the emotions, whereas the unstated goal in Eastern culture is more on the attainment of inner peace and harmony, almost, one might say, a purification of the soul. I do not suggest that in the words of Kipling, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Actually, both cultures converge in agreeing that literature is a remembrance of things past, of emotions recollected in tranquility. But before there is language, there is, before there is literature, there is language because language is the medium of literature. All literature is language, but all language is not literature. Dr. Johnson says, language is the dress of thought. As Wittgenstein has put it, die Grenzen meiner Sprache bedeuten die Grenzen meiner Welt. The limits of my language are the limits of my universe. Paul Valéry, the French poet, goes further. He calls language Le Dieu dans la chair égaré, the God who has gone astray in the flesh. Now every language must have a history. A language must be a mother tongue, which is why man-made languages like Esperanto may be said to have remained mere curiosities and they have produced no literature of lasting merit. Now, most world literatures are very rich. Turkish literature, in the form in which you know it, has an unbroken history of over 900 years. The Arabs have always been partial to poetry. In the 6th and seven, early 7th centuries, the Arabs gave so much importance to poetry that they chose the seven best Arabic poems, called the Sabah Mu'allaqat, the seven suspended poems 
and these poems were suspended on the walls of the Kaaba in Mecca. Of these, the most famous poem was by Imrul Kais. Kais had to flee Arabia later, and he died and was buried near Ankara. I have been to visit the site of his grave. There is no grave now, but there is a place where he might have been buried. Now, the Persians have a very long and well-known historical tradition and a literary tradition. The names of Firdausi, Hafiz, and Saadi are familiar to educated people all over the world. Persian is a rich and a melodious language. The classical poet exercising the greatest influence on the Western world these days is Mevlana Rumi, who wrote in Persian. Born in Afghanistan in 1207 AD, he died in Konya in 1273 AD. One click of the search engine Google for Rumi will give thousands of responses. Rumi's Mesnevi is a very important book. It begins with the complaint of the reed pipe. This is called Ney in the Middle East, in Arabic and Persian and in Turkish. Oh, hear the sound of this reed which complains and tells of separation and its pains. Since my stem was cut and this reed was made, men and women by my moans have been swayed. In his famous work, The West Oestliche Divan, published in 1819, the greatest German poet, Wolfgang, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, produced a book of poetry which he modeled after the work of the Persian poet Hafiz. Goethe's Divan exemplifies, he calls it the Divan, exemplifies how the Orient was central to German Romanticism. In the notes written by Goethe for the Divan is his famous line, Wer den Dichter will verstehen, muss in Dichter's Land again. Meaning, he who would understand the poet must go to the land of the poet. Now, it is a fundamental truth in the statement, the poet's song is sweet only in the land in, which, in, the land in which, where it is sung. The response created by a language in its own environment cannot be reproduced in translation. Indeed, one definition of poetry is, poetry is what is lost in translation. At its best, translation can only be like the underside of a carpet. The same threads are there, but the beauty of the pattern is absent. However, culture can be shared, even if not in the original. What is great in all the literatures of the world would, of course, appeal to all cultured minds. We are all human beings and have the same joys and sorrows. When the conqueror of Istanbul, Fatih Sultan Mehmed, entered the deserted Byzantine complex of Hagia Sophia in 1453, a quotation from the Persian poet Firdosi, Firdevsi, came naturally from his lips. Alone the spider now guards the door in the palace that was Caesar's home. And the watch song of the owl does soar even above Afrasiab's dome. Note the name of Afrasiab in Turkish mythology is Altertunga. Now, the history of literature goes back to the, to, the, to the invention of the earliest types of writing. But the complete literature was first developed by the ancient Greeks around 2500 years ago. Greek literature is rich in works of dramatic art, the tragedies of Sophocles, the comedies of Aristophanes, 
the plays of Euripides and Aeschylus go back to the pre-Christian era. Moreover, these plays are still performed on the stage. Now, the play Waiting for Godot was first published in the French version by Samuel Beckett as En Attendant Godot in 1952. Beckett later translated the play himself into English and the first performance in English was given as Waiting for Godot in London on the 3rd of August 1955. Beckett, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1969, was a very rare example of a creative writer who published the same work in two major languages. Now, something can be learned from him. He translated, and we say that the success of a translation is that it should not read like one. Now, in the, some of you may have seen the Turkish version, which is called Godoy Beklerken. And there is a song sung by Vladimir in the Act 2. In the French version, it is Un chien va dans l'office et pris une andouillette, alors à coup, coup de louche, le chef le mis en miette. The English version of Waiting for Godot says A dog came in the kitchen and stole a crust of bread, then cook up with a ladle and beat him till he was dead. Now, the translation of poetry is a suicidal job. Now, Beckett, he renders andouillette, which is a small French sausage, by crust of bread. Partly, of course, to obtain the rhyme with dead. The word for pantry in French has been put into English as kitchen. Again, the expression smash to pieces in French has become beat him till he was dead. So, successful translation involves the process of what, of what might be called transcreation. It is not just translation, it is transcreation. Now, the poems of Sappho are amongst the earliest surviving poems written by a woman. Similarly, Herodotus and Thucydides were masters of prose, especially the writing of history. A great achievement of the Greeks was in philosophy, and so great was the contribution of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle to philosophy, that their works were translated into Arabic by the Muslims, while Europe was still in the Dark Ages and did not know about them. Europe rediscovered ancient Greece through Arabic translations. Now, it is also notable that at the famous University of Cambridge, the chair in Greek was founded in 1540, the chair of Arabic in 1632, the chair in Latin in 1869, and the chair in English as late as 1910. So you see, universities are not always ahead of their times. Okay, well, literature is not simple writing. Poetry and prose both have strict rules, in addition to the rules of grammar. 